Welcome everybody and welcome to this edition of the BioXL webinar. This is a student webinar and in particular is the student webinar connected to the BioXL School of 2022nd edition. So the presenter of today are the, are the students that won the poster prize for the BioXL School that was run at the end of March. And in particular, we have as a speaker, Christina Hill from the from Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Science. Then we have uh, Elena Girames Rizzo from the University of Girona and Leonardo Salicari from the University of Paola. I'm hosting this webinar. I'm Alessandra from the Royal Institute of Technology. And with me, there is Marca Leonores Linares from the European Bioinformatics Institute. So we have Christina Hill and uh, as a first speaker, and she will speak about cross-grain modeling of a sabutanol and sameterol binding to beta-2 angiogenic receptor. Then we'll be followed by Elena, that we will speak about how the assignment of protonation states in distal residue might alter protein binding, protein ligand binding in molecular dynamic simulation. And then we have Leonardo that will speak about folding mechanism or entelagol proteins. So now we can start with Christina, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Alessandra, for the kind introduction. I'm Christina. I'm I'm going to talk about the main uh, the main project in my PhD that I'm developing uh, developing under the supervision of Sebastian Thalmayer, that is called uh, coarse grain modeling of salbutamol and salmeterol binding to beta two adrenergic receptor. So. The outline of the presentation is the following. I will start giving a short introduction about this system. Then I will explain how the ligands are parameterized and how they behave in the membrane. Then I will also talk a little bit about how the protein is parameterized and how the ligand and the protein behave in the membrane. Uh, afterwards, I will show some results about the, some simulations that I performed with the ligand placed in the non-binding pocket and some binding events that I was able to observe finishing with some conclusions and future perspectives about the project. So this beta-2 adrenergic receptor belongs to the family of the protein couple receptors that are one of the main drug targets. They are integral membrane port proteins uh, that convert external signals into intracellular responses. Uh, one of their common characteristics is uh, that they present seven transmembrane domains. I'm showing here these seven transmembrane domains in different colors for the beta-2 adrenergic receptor that uh, this beta-2 adrenergic receptor is mainly located in the airway smooth muscles. The beta-2 adrenergic receptor agonists are the molecules that bind to this protein, triggering a conformational change uh, to the active state of the protein. Salmeterol and salbutamol are two of them. They are already known drugs employed in the treatment of uh, several respiratory diseases. When they bind to this beta-2 adrenergic receptor, uh, in the airway the smooth muscles, they cause an intracellular cascade that inhibits the contraction of the muscle fibers, resulting in a relaxation of the tissue. And this relaxation reduces the obstruction to the airflow, so it makes it easier uh, to breathe. And they are known to have a high affinity to this beta-2 adrenergic receptor, but their banding pathways have not yet been fully characterized. Here we have the salmeterol and salbutamol in red and blue, respectively. As you may appreciate, the salmeterol uh, head is quite similar to salbutamol, but the only difference in this structure is the uh, long tail of salmeterol. Okay, for studying this project, I will use coarse grain molecular dynamics. Well, I'm using coarse grain molecular dynamics. I'm employing Martini 3 uh, as force field. And now I will explain a little bit how the ligand parameterization is performed in Martini. Uh, firstly, an atomistic simulation is performed and is taken as reference. Then uh, you can see in this picture how the uh, bits are defined. So there are different sizes of bits, like that they uh, represent two, three, or four non-hydrogen atoms. And uh, you have to select how you uh, want to, uh, how the amount that you want to add and the type that it depends on the characteristics of the chemical characteristics of the atoms that they are representing. So for instance, uh, the type depends on the polarity of these atoms. 
The aim here is to reproduce the bond angles and the hydral distributions of this atomistic uh, uh, simulation. So here I'm showing three examples of the bond angle and the hydral, where the blue line is representing the atomistic uh, distributions and the red line is the coarse grain Martini model. Uh, so you can see easily that the bone and angle are quite, uh, so the models are quite well capturing the distributions of both of them. And also in the dihedral, but this time the, the modality of the atomistic is not um, captured, but the coarse grain model cannot be. But there is a single configuration of the coarse grain that is uh, capturing both. Okay, then it is also important to account for the symmetry, size, and volume of the molecule that you are parametrizing. For that, I computed the solvent accessible surface area. So here we have uh, this, uh, the, the molecule, the salmetro, and the blue net is the atomistic SASA, so the solvent accessible surface area, and the red one is the coarse grain. So you can see that the, this red net is capturing well the volume of the, of the molecule. Here uh, we also see the average values for atomistic and coarse grain that they are 9.3, 9.2 square nanometers. So it's quite in good agreement. Also considering the importance of the membrane for these molecules, I perform uh, an atomistic and coarse grain simulation in an organic solvent. I choose the hexadecane and they were also uh, performing uh, quite well. They were in good agreement too. Furthermore, I compare the um, I calculated for the, my model the energy, free energy of transfer from hydrated octanol to water that was around 24 kilojoules per mole. That it, this is also in good agreement with the experimental value that I found. Then, once we have the models, uh, we want to test how they behave in the membrane. So, for that, I set up a system in which uh, the um, here is the membrane and BOPC membrane was selected and the ligands are placed in the water phase. So the results of these simulations were uh, are shown in this density plot where this brown curve is, uh, is representing the density of the BOPC or the membrane. These are the polar heads of the lipids composing the membrane and the rest of them are accounting for the ligands placed in the water phase. So you can see that uh, they rapidly enter the membrane and they stay in the leaflet in which they enter. So uh, the only one that is in the other side, it, uh, it, that's because it diffuses through the periodic boundary conditions and enter the other leaflet, the membrane. But they basically don't move, uh, don't diffuse into water or they do not change leaflet. This was the case for Salmetro. I performed analogous simulations for salbutamol where you can appreciate that the density plot is quite different. So this time salbutamol is also entering the membrane and, but it's not, it's not changing leaflet neither, but it's diffusing through the water phase as well. So this time we can see how it diffuses through the periodic boundary conditions and uh, stays in both leaflets of the membrane. And if we compare, so if we obtain a density plot of only this polar heads that we explained for it was similar in salbutamol and salmetero, we see that they are placed in a similar depth in the membrane. Then um, we want to parameterize the protein. For that, I firstly uh, selected the uh, a structure from the uh, alpha pole server. There were some crystal structures available, but they were lacking of some amino acids. So by comparing them, they, they were extremely similar. That's why I decided to take the alpha pole structure. There are two possibilities for reproduce this secondary structure of the proteins in coarse grain, that is the elastic network or the colic model. And the elastic network is using harmonic potentials for representing these bonds, while the colic model is using Leonard Jones potentials. So for Selecting one of them, I test this flexibility of both models against uh, an atomistic simulation that I performed with the protein embedded in the membrane. So here we see that the purple curve is the atomistic simulation and the yellow one that stands for the Golag model was uh, eating better the flexibility of it rather than the, the green one that is, stands for the elastic network. So I took the Golag model. Furthermore, uh, I need to select 
another structure for this uh, contact maps in the collect model that, that is the interactions that are uh, established between the, the, the atoms. And I had, again, I wanted to use the crystal structure, but it was uh, lacking of some residues, as I told you. So here we see that these uh, two alpha helices were completely uh, without uh, any kind of uh, restrictions. So uh, I decided to take again the alpha pole structure. I also tested the values for the Lena George potentials, the epsilon values, and the two kilojoules per mole was representing uh, best the atomistic flexibility. So then we have the model of the protein and the models of the ligands. So I displayed, so I set up a system in which the protein was embedded in the membrane and the ligands were again placed in the water phase. So here we see again a density plot that is quite different from the one we observed before. That we see that salmeterol is changing actually the leaflet. So it's moving from one side to the other in the membrane, populating the, the center. This is, the, this is how the, uh, this event is taking place. So it, this is uh, going from blue to red in time. The balls are the edges of the membrane. So it's using the protein to change leaflet in the membrane. To study more in depth this uh, event, I performed carbon analysis. So I uh, took the number of contacts of each of the residues in the protein and the, um, the molecules of the, the salmeterol. And this is the graphs that, that I obtained for five different replicas. The colors are uh, the same ones are the, and the, as the dress membrane regions that I show you before. And for the sake of simplicity, you can observe in this uh, red bar graph that the H4, H5, and H7 domain are the ones with the highest number of contacts. This is also uh, displayed here. In red, the highest number of contacts are shown. This is for the front and the back. But you may appreciate that there is no, not clear pathway in which the salmeter is following to flip flop. So I need to perform further analysis on this. Then I perform similar simulations for salbutamol, well, analogous simulation, and flip-flop was also taking place, but the, they were not occurring that often. In fact, in uh, this uh, first simulation that I am showing with the, these 10 ligands, they were not flip-flopping, they were basically only diffusing through the water phase, but I performed a second simulation in which I uh, limited, so rest restrained, these the molecules to diffuse into the water phase. And here we see that they are actually two of them are flip-flopping, but this is not occurring as often as for some material. So these are the results of some simulations in which I place the ligands in the known binding pocket in the protein. This density, these distance plots are these distances between the molecule and the binding pocket in the protein. And we see that the salmeterol uh, or the replicas of salmeterol are staying in the binding pocket. This shows that the molecule has a high affinity for the protein. For salmeterol, we see that although some of the ligands in some replicas they left, but more than 50% remain. So we see that there is also a really high affinity for the protein. Here, I wanted to show a binding event that I could observe for salbutamol. So uh, this distance is again the, the distance from the ligand, salbutamol, and the binding pocket. And we can appreciate three binding events taking place. But here there is a snapshot of, this, of one of these binding events. And we see how the, the salbutamol uh, ligand is entering through the membrane and also through the water phase. So this is the binding event. So as a conclusion, what I can say is that the models, the big models were uh, mimicking well the, the, what the drugs are doing. So salmeterol is staying mainly in the membrane while salbutamol is also entering the water phase. They are, they, as they are a long acting, a short acting uh, drug respectively. So short acting means that it's getting expelled from the, expelled from the body faster. So that's why uh, salbutamol is, uh, this is in good agreement with it. 
And then the protein model was also quite uh, well reproducing the flexibility of this atomistic, and it was allowing the binding, as we saw in the last snapshot. When this, uh, when this protein was included in the membrane, flip-flops were taking place for uh, salmeterol mainly, but also with salbutamol. And there were some binding events already observed for salbutamol. So the questions that I will uh, intend to address later will be what is enabling uh, the flip-flops in, sal in salmeterol, why is occurring rarely in the case of salbutamol compared to salmeterol, and what are the main binding pathways for each of the ligands? Do they mainly enter from the water phase or via the membrane? Thank you for your attention. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so good afternoon. Um, yeah, thanks by yourself for letting me introduce my research. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's, without further ado, let's, let's uh, dive in into a little project I've been working on for the past months. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so, so, um, but we're about to start uh, a molecular dynamic simulations. First, uh, in biomolecular research, what we usually do is we visit this web server, the put in that event, uh, so as to retrieve the starting structure um, of the biomolecule we wish to simulate. And by statistics, we will mostly uh, we'll most likely end up with a crystal structure and with not enough resolution so as to get information on the hydrogen atoms. And this is a quite a big limitation because then we would have some doubts about uh, which photonation states we should assign to, uh, to the table residues. Fortunately, as uh, some photonation tools were developed and they do help a lot, they, they became indispensable in, in our research, but they still can fail. And so it's what it's actually encouraged is to revise at the, at the region of interest and check if the protonation states are well defined. So for instance, in this protein light and binding uh, example, so we would uh, set, define our region of interest as the, the binding site, and then we would look around like five axioms and check if those residues are well defined. And here comes our research question. What if we need to look further? So this is our object of the study. Uh, we are simulating uh, gypsum as, a, as our enzyme and one of, and one of its inhibitors, benzamidine. And benzamidine binds uh, to aspartate 189 Hughes Aldrich. And we actually hypothesize that uh, this residue over here that is located over uh, 13 astrons away from this binding site is critical, essential for the binding of benzamidine. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, okay, so sorry about that. So following on, we actually hypothesize this, this residue over here is very is critical for the lion binding into its, into its binding site. One thing about to note about this system is that it's a standard protein ligand model because contrary to the usual ligand uh, binding um, yeah, models, in which we find that the time scale of lag binding is on the millisecond range. This one happens very fast. In the nanosecond range, we can actually observe them with uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And so it's widely used for us to benchmark novel methodologies. And this is to us because maybe you're wondering why we did hypothesize that this one, this recipe, is critical for uh, the binding of this ligand. Well, in the past, our group uh, tried to uh, benchmark in our methodology, and we were actually very surprised because we couldn't find like almost any binding event. And we, we were shocked because we were supposed to find a lot of binding events. 
So looking carefully at the system, uh, we actually realize that this residue over here could adopt another protonation state than the ones uh, suggested by the utilities. So, um, so the utility suggested that, uh, that this residue had uh, both uh, delta and epsilon positions protonated, but then by hydrogen bond analysis, so it means looking at potential hydrogen bonds, really uh, we realize that this one over here is also possible. So how are we going to test uh, the influence of this residue? We're just going to run simulations uh, for each of the possible protonation states. So we're going to use the Amherst programs and we're going to run spontaneous molecular dynamic simulations. What do the spontaneous molecular dynamic simulations mean? It means that we place the ligand into the solvent far away from the enzyme and we lay it organically uh, bind into the, into the protein. In the way we can capture the ligand binding pathway in an unbiased way. So this is our computational protocol. We run 50 replicas each of 200 nanoseconds. And then we also follow up with a, a constant pH approach. Uh, more, um, more completely, we use the discrete constant pH in explicit salt. So just to give a little bit of insight on how this works, the user selects beforehand which residues are allowed to trade. And, and after a set of molecular dynamic steps, which we also set beforehand, these residues may change the protonation state via metropolis of the capital attempts. So, uh, yeah, as the simulation progresses, uh, yeah, we, we do not only get information on the dynamical movements of the system, but also on the, on, on the sampling of this protonation state. So we actually take into account the equilibrium. And um, well, this is our computational protocol. We run two sets in two relevant pH of 30 replicas and 200 nanoseconds each. Okay. So after running the simulations, um, we did in our results and we're, well, we found very striking, I mean, very contrasting results. We found a very big difference in the number of encountered binding events. So, for instance, in the, in the charge protonation form, we found that there's only 10% of the replicas that we simulated uh, yield a uh, binding event, whilst for the neutral ones, we found that almost 50% do evaporate with binding. We also monitor some key distances to see how far we are from the reference. And we matched that uh, those numbers, uh, with the exception of the Kia case, in which we find that uh, the distances with uh, its neighboring with, with its neighboring atoms differs quite a bit. So we deem it uh, this potential state as not as realistically accurate, and so we are going to focus our discussion uh, with a comparison with a comparison between these two cases over here. In order to um, assess how the binding pathway uh, uh, well, is, dependent of, is dependent on this uh, residue over here, what we did was plot a two-dimensional hysteron. In the two dimensions, of course, the binding distance, so the distance from the ligand to the binding site, and also the distance from the ligand to, the, to that hysteron, 57. And we can actually relate this two-dimensional hysteron with the free energy and this dissipation over here. So we're actually plotting in this control plots the free energy landscape. Um, but it's basically a two-dimensional hysteron. So here in these regions, we are actually seeing we actually see the, the more densely regions, more densely populated regions. And so we can trace the binding pathway connected to the regions, and we find two very di different pathways depending on the on the protonation state. So one goes right through that history, while the other go, uh, goes directly uh, well, until uh, the binding side. So trying to understand it a little bit more, yeah, uh, we observe the trajectories. And for instance, in the in the one that is protonated in the delta position.
So the ligand is up to the solvent, and we see how it interacts with that piece second through hydrogen bonding. And well, and through and thanks to that hydrogen bonding, it can the ligand can be a real into that pocket, and so and then it binds. Okay, so and for the heat case, the one that's originated at both delta and epsilon positions, here I'm going to uh, show you a trajectory that's quite interesting because it first tries to uh, go right through that histidine, but then it fails again, it passes through that histidine, and so it goes back to the solvent, and then it barely, uh, barely goes to the middle and diffuses into that pan inside. So we can do structurally, we start from the solvent, which is that histidine, cannot form any hydrogen bonding, but it does find, and it does form pi pi setting interactions. This is the only other interaction that we found. But, uh, I mean, it can fully be oriented in that pocket. Uh, it cannot pass through that history because, well, notice that both the species are charged. Um, so yeah, there's a like setting proportion. And so going through that history is not favored at all. So you cannot really pass through that. It goes back to the solvent, and then by probability, it diffuses into the binding pocket. So from the constant phase populations, we can actually uh, compute and retrieve the populations of the pigmation states. And well, and from the calculated binding events, uh, percentage of binding events, uh, and comparing them to the extreme phases. We actually uh, well, get a middle ground. We also okay. we also computed the um, the free energy landscapes for the two constant phase cases, and we will see the two binding pathways as well. And also we scattered some representative uh, trajectories into that uh, into those contour plots with. Um, color coding uh, the frames into the state of that histidine. And we actually see that in the region uh, where the ligand interacts with uh, that histidine, it's mostly the heat case for the region delta. So the hydrogen bond interaction is it's what we find here. Yeah, and let me just focus on this slide here. Uh, this, is, this summarizes everything. And that is like the most important slide. So what we will see is that uh, uh, the heat population, so probably in delta here, the 0, 25, 60, 100, we see how this uh, binding pattern starts to form. And it gets more from it. And of course, from the results of the ratio of banding events, we we know that this binding pathway that is formed because of this change in population is responsible for the increase in the amount of binding events. So basically, if we simulate with the alternated or with permutated delta, we see striking big differences in the amount of binding events, but also in the binding pathway. And this is something that I want to remark that the assignment of population states, we study the binding side can influence a lot uh, the computation, the computational characterization, uh, in this case, in the So, uh, so we advise that the, that the residues that are, that are found along the pathway should always be considered. Population states should always should, should always be devised, especially um, in studies where the path is relevant. So, in spontaneous random simulations, for, for instance, and especially when modeling difficult or not sufficiently known systems. Uh, additionally, two common assumptions that we made uh, in the computing the molecular dynamics community is that we usually tend to simulate that physiological pH and we fix population states. But, you know, uh, it's reported that over 60% of the random events in, in both population changes and, and enzymes in biocatalytic studies are very sensitive to pH changes and also the catalytic cycle can involve uh, the definition of state changes. So, so this is maybe to, to, to put forward and let the community consider that 
well, I mean, computer science system, it's uh, similar with the relevant, at the, at the relevant pH, and also maybe consider including custom pH in facts. So, and this is the end of my presentation. I uh, want to acknowledge, of course, my, my two supervisors, the group I belong, and the suggestions that made uh, the system is possible with their funding and the organizations I belong and all the people that go there. And all of you for, for your kind attention. And finally, I also want to share that uh, there is a study where actually um, wrote an article, it's it's already sent in a journal, we're hoping for the best and it gets accepted, but in the, in the meantime, it's already posted in the, in the bio archive, so if you want to know a little bit more about it, do check it out. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Leonardo Salicari, and today I'm going to talk about the folding mechanism of a special class of entangled protein. And I'll do so with a brief introduction to entanglement through uh, knotted proteins. Here you see a subset of knotted protein characterized by a knot in their uh, backbone. Even though this protein has been studied for the past 20 years and more, uh, it's still unclear if having such a complex topological structure is uh, evolutionary advantageous for the protein. And moreover, from the point of view of describing the folding kinetics, uh, this structure poses some challenges, both theoretically and computationally speaking. Nevertheless, in the recent years, uh, as be, um, some simple topological descriptor has been found to, uh, to be good at infer some kinetics uh, features of the folding, such as uh, folding rates. And inspired by this, a group here in Padova in the recent years uh, introduced a simple topological descriptor called Gaussian entanglement that you can see here. Without going into the mathematical details, this observable tried to quantify the self-entanglement of a protein backbone. Practically, this means that this is able to characterize this kind of structures characterized by an entang a loop closed by an active contact here in red, and another chain portion here in blue passing through it called a thread. Here we have a, an example of such a structure that we took more in a minute. This kind of structure called entangled loop are fine in 32% of protein domains, and therefore they are quite interesting to study their folding behavior. And moreover, we hope that the Gaussian entanglement is able to uh, tell us more about the folding kinetics of these structures. Uh, for, from a large scale analysis of the protein data bank um, of this structure, two main results were found. First of all, that these loops, these red loops, tend to be uh, more present towards the C terminal side of the entanglement they are in which basically means that we have an asymmetry in the distribution of these loops. And another fact is that the loops, the contacts that close in these loops, which are the one with ISG prime value in modulus, tends to be weakly bound. This two observation led to the hypothesis of a possible control mechanism for the protein to keep under control the folding of these structures which is basically tends to postpone, the proteins tends to postpone the formation of the, the, of the loop towards the later stage of the folding. And my work starting from this hypothesis is to test it through molecular dynamics simulation of folding events. Particularly we, in my work, I took the, the RD1 uh, protein, which is a small fast folding protein and a type three antifreeze protein and to perform multiple folding simulation in order to understand its kinetics. And to do so, uh, as you were seeing from the previous slide, I use a cons grain model in which each residues is represented by a alpha carbon coupled with a structure-based potential or go-like potential where the absolute minimum represents the native structure. 
Moreover, I use, uh, I simulate um, implicit solvent through Langevin dynamics. This model basically has two purposes. The first one is to be computationally efficient in order to simulate a lot of folding trajectory. And then um, to highlight the, topo the, topological, the, the topological effect, um, the native topology effect on the folding kinetics. And indeed, uh, this model is able to reproduce the free energy profile of the protein, which is a two-state uh, kind of uh, kinetics. So if we look at the folding simulation, I performed more than 100 simulations in order to study and characterize uh, the average contact formation time for each native contact. To do so, we define a, um, an observable which is one when the contact is formed and zero otherwise. And if we average this over the trajectory and take the time, uh, time series of this observer, we see that this has uh, some kind of sigmodal uh, behavior. And if we fit it uh, to a sigmodal, we can obtain two parameters. The first one is a T star, which kind of uh, tell us the average formation time for that contact and a K parameter, which uh, um, estimate the cooperativity of the, of the contact formation, which is basically the time, the first derivative uh, of this curve at the T star. And here is what we found. If we plot the average con contact formation time and the cooperativity, we clearly see, first of all, a correlation between the two, but most importantly about the color code, uh, we have that dark region represents uh, higher value of G prime. As I was, as I was mentioning, this dark region are, re are related to the formation of the loop. And as you can see here, the loop is formed in the later stage of the folding event, basically confirming uh, uh, the, the hypothesis I was mentioning uh, for this particular protein. Moreover, um, G prime allows us also to visualize uh, as a reaction coordinate the trajectory. In this histogram, we can see the G prime going from zero to one where the entanglement is formed and the fraction of net in contact, which highlights first, firstly the um, unfolded ensemble and then the native ensemble. This, uh, this experiment shows that another ensemble appears, which is actually a kinetic trap due to the fact that the protein is not able to form its uh, uh, entangled topology. As you can see here, the thread is not correctly inserted on the loop as in the native configuration. Therefore, the entangled topology uh, causes kinetic traps uh, in, the, um, in the folding trajectories. Moreover, we highlight uh, uh, this possible pathway, which is a direct folding path, a path through uh, towards the kinetic trap. And from the kinetic trap, the protein tends to or uh, unfold and refold correctly, which is a backtracking event, or tends to go to the native ensemble through a threading procedure in which this blue portion insert correctly into the, the red one. And basically the take home message from this is that firstly, the entangled topology uh, affects uh, with a kinetic trap the folding, and, but also that G prime is able to uh, help us resolve this ensemble from the correct native ones. Also, these results are qualitatively um, compared with the folding experiment of uh, the RD1 uh, protein. As you can see here, we have a, a calorimetric experiment which uh, uh, measured the folding event of RD1, where these two variables are related by each other through a linear relation where the slope represents the change in volume from an unfolded to folding configuration. And here we can see two signal. One that can be associated with the, the two events representing a direct folding or a folding towards a kinetic trap. 
and a signal which has uh, which correspond to a smaller change in uh, the volume that can be could be associated with the threading event as possible outlooks uh, uh, more research about uh, this particular structure uh, structure uh, one one could address the first the asymmetry in the distribution of entangled loop by considering the co-translation co event as uh, um, the, the main ag agent to um, cause this asymmetry between the C and N terminus. And future work uh, we, we are planning to do is to uh, try to probe in co-translation event, firstly through molecular dynamics simulation, but also uh, using statistical models in order to uh, have a larger sampling of these events and trying to understand uh, where, this as where this asymmetry comes from. And this ended up, this ends up my presentation and I thank you for your attention. Yeah, so thank you, Cristina, Elena, and Leonardo for your presentations. We have uh, some questions already, uh, but please uh, write your questions on the, on the Q&A panel. So, uh, Cristina, uh, the first question is for you. Uh, did you reverse the coarse grain model to uh, all atom again and compare them with the all atom simulations? Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Mm, no, actually I didn't need to do it. So, I mean, I just, so the atomistic was used in first place to check that my models were correctly mimicking how the, the how in the atomistic, uh, how, how the atomistic ones are performing. But uh, yeah, once the, once I, once I checked that they were working good and quite in good agreement with them, I didn't need to reverse it. Uh, to check with the atomistic till now. Um, so I just like uh, got all these results from uh, as, as I saw, and it was quite clear. So I didn't need to hope this answers the questions a bit. Uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, yeah, Warren, if you have any follow up question or so, you can just uh, write it and we'll, I will read it. So there's another question for Christina from Mercedes. Uh, very nice talk, Christina. Have you considered using other structure, structural models of your receptors, such as the ones available in the GPCR the database? So uh, I have to confess that I wasn't aware of this GPCR database. So thank you very much for the information. <laughs> and I will, I will take it for sure. But no, I didn't consider till now because, I mean, I don't know if you know the AlphaFold server, but it basically it gives you, so by machine learning, it gives you an extractor that is, uh, they are quite in good agreement with the, usually they perform quite well. So they are quite in good, in good agreement with experimental ones. And, uh, but I wanted to be sure of this. And that's why I check with the, there are not only one, but like three, at least three crystal structures available for this protein. And they were quite similar to my receptor. So this beta 2 energy receptor. So no, I didn't, I didn't consider using another one till now, but can be a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. So let's move to Elena and Leonardo now. Uh, so there's a question that sits at two and three. So I guess it's for both of you. Uh, so let's start with Elena. The question is how to decide the directionality of the pathway from the 2D projection population heat maps? Okay, thank you for the question. So, uh, actually, no, it's okay. uh, what we did was um, in the two dimensional system we identified the areas which were most populated, right? So we actually developed a program that uh, can actually filter these regions um, from the from the trajectory frames. So in that way, we can apply some directionality and let's, let's say so from 
for total vision A, we can go to population vision B and then go to C and then go back to OS B again. So in that case, that's what how we could apply this directionality. Um, so although we can, because we know that the end is always the binding force because I mean, uh, these simulations were enough to observe binding, but not enough to observe bind and binding. So usually when we had a binding event, so I mean, it stayed there. I mean, the cell which is very, uh, is very strong. So we know that the end is always a binding. And so, yeah, I mean, we can definitely draw this from the, from the, um, the two-dimensional system we can already do protocol in pathway, but also we developed uh, this uh, theorem so that we can connect these regions that are mo more populated and we can give a sense of directionality. And so we, we did validate it with, with that. And of course, then we observed the trajectories. I hope this answers the question. Thank you, Elena. So Leonardo, if you can answer the same question. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. And for me, basically, the, um, the idea was to look at the time series for both the reaction coordinates, and it's quite uh, uh, easy to understand which are the, the directionality because it's quite simple, the system. And moreover, uh, to identify the threading procedure, uh, one can also identify a smaller group, uh, another reaction coordinate, which is a more local one to um, select those contacts related to the formation of the, that particular uh, interaction between the thread and the loop. Therefore, by checking and uh, by, by checking the time series of this, you can realize which is the directionality for the pathways. Thank you, Leonardo. So, there's a, another question for Christina. If anyone has questions, you can still add them to the Q&A panel. Uh, so Christina Sinat says, uh, thank you for your beautiful presentation. I don't know about coarse grain Martinez simulation and all atom simulation. Can you just tell me the main difference of them? Also, if I want to study interaction between enzyme and polymer plastic in the presence of different solvents, can I use coarse grain Martini simulation to build large plastic unit? If yes, then would I place whole polymer as one unit? Okay, that's a long question. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will start and maybe also Leonardo can add a bit more on mm -hmm. this. But uh, so the main difference of coarse grain and atomistic simulation uh, is that with uh, atomistic, also called all atom simulations, you are uh, you, you are simulating all the atoms. Let's see all the hydrogens and non-hydrogen atoms, uh, all the atoms. But co with coarse grain, which what you are doing is simplifying the simulation. So, for instance, um, as I saw, these three different types of bits. These are the bits, so the the molecules turn into the bits in coarse grain. And uh, so I was, instead of um, um, simulating two atoms with the uh, two non hydrogen atoms with the hydrogen, so there is only one molecule that is representing all of them. So this makes that the simulation is um, much more simple, and therefore you can perform like really long time scale simulations in case you're your event is uh, really long, it takes time to occur, or you need a really long sampling or whatever. Um, then it also, if your system is really large, so you can, this is really good for this. Then this is my case for this binding pathways events. I, I need to simulate this huge, uh, well, not huge, but uh, a whole protein, the membrane and the ligands, and also for a really long time to observe this binding and to see how the binding goes. Therefore, I use the coarse grain Martini. Okay, then uh, you ask about the uh, specific case of an enzyme and a polymer plastic in the presence of different solvents. So yeah, for sure, you can model this with Martini. Uh, coarse grain, um, but as uh, you are mentioning an enzyme, I don't know if you are interested in the um, forming or breaking of bonds because this is not possible to observe with coarse grain. Mm, I would say not even with 
molecular dynamics, classical molecular dynamics, well, any kind of molecular dynamics. Um, so for this, you will need maybe uh, quantum mechanics. Maybe you can also check QMMM simulations, quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics. But for sure, if you are not interested in this, and the, the, as I said, the system is big and you need a really long time, this uh, using Cosrain can be really interesting. Yeah. OK, hope this is a nice <laughs> answer for. <laughs> But if you have some questions, uh, I think there was my mail there. You can also contact me and I can add more on this. Thank you. Thank you, Cristina. So we have another question for you. Uh, how far was the ligand placed in each case? Could that as well as the starting structure bias the results obtained at the end? So uh, it depends on where which simulations you mean so in in mostly all of the simulations i basically place the ligands exactly in the same place so i basically just cut this long tail of salmeterol and there was salbutamol so i don't think this can be a huge bias on this because they were basically the same mm, so no yeah <laughs> i don't know thank you christina so uh, alessandra do you want to ask any questions? So if there are no more questions, I have a couple of questions. So one question I have for Elena. So did you discuss the protonation of the residue? But in principle, you could have also different protonation states for the ligand. So did you thought about that? And what yes. is your reflection on that? Right, uh, you're totally right. Um, it's not when we are uh, about um, designing the constant pH uh, methodology. We, we actually um, thought about and just you know, put it as a little idea, maybe we should uh, titrate the enzymity as well. But yeah, I mean, we assume that, I mean, that, uh, well, that that position state uh, was fixed so we made an assumption but of course i mean we can you can of course uh take into account that the ligand can also uh, can also change the, the position state um but yeah i mean maybe a little bit of a paradox here because i mean we do make this assumption in the ligand was well we do not make it in the histidine right but well i mean histidine uh the ph is i mean the pk is very close to the physiological one and I think that the PK, the PK of enzymatin is like 13 or something like that. So it's a very basic compound. We, the thing is, that, uh, yeah, we assume that it didn't change. But there was a tipping part in the constant pH methodology. But yeah, sure. I mean, you may, I mean, yeah, you may consider it uh, in some cases. Yeah, and I noticed that at one point you lose uh, planarity on your ligand. Is that something that worried you or not? Uh, maybe I can I can share again the screen. Uh, but but if something that you didn't thought about, you no, know, this you can just I noticed that sometimes uh, your uh, your ligand is not planar while I thought it was completely planar, but. Uh, I, I guess we did, I mean, it's all dynamic effects. I mean, we didn't really give a lot of thought uh, on this. And also, I guess what is it? Because I mean, the interaction is in the, the amino group and not, I mean, so the planet. No, I mean, I mean in the amino group. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do believe, you know, this is on the dynamics and also the, the hydrogen bond interactions uh, that, uh, that do occur. And that make that may make it that you know the disparity. Yeah, I know. Also, that group are very difficult to describe uh, at the atomistic level with the force field with standard force field. So a, might a be this. Um, you know. Thank you. And I was wondering, uh, for Leonardo, I have a, a curiosity. Uh, so you have thought, you told us that thirty-two percent of the protein domain has showed this uh, type of conformation. 
did you look in, because I was curious, I think a while ago there was discussion on this or not uh, in a deposit structure in the PDB data bank. Did you notice if all those structures come from the same type of experimental technique or from different type of experimental technique? Uh, do you mean that uh, if these structures are coming from, for example, X-ray diffraction? X-ray or cryo-EM or NMR or whatever. Or okay. they all come, because I recall a discussion a while ago on the ribosome structure where they see that if they were deposited from some, I think I forgot which, which what was, but there was a difference in the number of not if we are coming from cryo-EM or from X-ray. So I was just curious. Well, um, a precise uh, answer to this question, I have not. But if I have to guess, uh, because this structure can be identified um, only by looking at the backbone, I think that uh, um, we, we, don't, we don't need actually something like a, a higher resoluted structure such as uh, X-ray diffraction at uh, less than one angstrom, for example, we can use uh, also NMR and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, uh, this structure comes from uh, a lot of from from all the, um, the the experimental technique, but I would not be sure about the percentage about those. Yeah, no, I was, I was just curious. It was just a curiosity. And then do they have the same function or they have very different function, those protein? No, no, they have different function. Nevertheless, uh, there is no actually one-to-one -one correspondence between this uh, topology and the function. So it's kind of interesting also that this kind of topology are used uh, uh, as such different example uh, ex uh, function. For example, the what I was mentioning uh, before, is used to for um, is used by some uh, animals to prevent the, the crystallization of water in order to survive a, a sub-zero um, environment, for example. Okay, yeah, it's a way of antifreeze approaching some of those. I saw, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think our time is over. I thank you all the speaker for being in time, it was wonderful. Thank you very much and thank you for the nice presentation. And I just want to steal some minutes to the attendees just to tell about the following up webinar. Just give me a moment that I share my screen. So the next webinar, there will be a standard by Excel webinar. And uh, we'll be on the, we will go on to speak about the use case in by Excel. And this time we will speak about QMMM simulation of fluorescent protein and proton dynamics. And this will be the 10th of May. And the speaker will be Dimitri Morkos from the University of Uvescula and Dimitri, uh, Mirko, sorry, Mikko Palikat from, the, from ULIC. Thank you for your attention and for the active participation. And uh, yeah, see you next time.